Hi, Tony from All The Remote Things here again. And I'm here, but this is a great privilege for me to have Stephen Bungay with us. How are you, Stephen? Uh, I'm doing well, thanks. Um, the sun is shining very brightly, uh, which is a bit unusual in this country. But um, looking forward to having a good chat with you. Brilliant. Stephen, I, I think it'd be great if you could introduce yourself and, and, and where, you've, you, where you've come from for, for the viewers. Yeah, so some of that is perhaps relevant to uh, the rather peculiar nature of the book, The Art of Action. So I started my career with the Boston Consulting Group and I was there for about 20 years. Um, at that time, it was a strategy boutique. Um, so I spent the beginning of my career developing strategies, but realized after a while that the real issue was executing them. And I became more and more interested in that. Learned a bit about it at BCG, but then I left um to really strike out on my own and investigate this issue and i also have a parallel career as a military historian and it was when i left bcg that i wrote my first uh, book about the battle of britain and a second one about alamein and it was in writing that second book that i discovered that the germans had developed this what i would call an operating model that they called auftrags tactic which is a bit of a mouthful and which we now call mission command um that was all about being fast and agile in a very uncertain fast-changing environment and i thought well hello that's the environment all my clients have to deal with so i wonder whether it can be used in business and so for the next um 10 years or so i sort of worked up the principles but also put them into practice so the book took a long time to write because i wanted to make sure that the techniques actually worked in a wide variety of client situations it came out in 2011 uh it's been in print ever since so the publisher reissued it um in the the summer of uh, 2021 and i spend most of my time these days working with clients on what they call embedding the principles so the principles are actually pretty easy to understand but actually making them work is hard work yes yes so i came across your book because the consultancy that i was working for um they they gave the book to everybody that that joined although i was working mm. before that as well so which was brilliant um i think there's a lots of different people i talked to a lot of different people at a lot of different co companies and consultancies and everybody has a version of what the art yes. of action actually is right action, so if, yeah. and, and i'll give you some of the ones i've heard just so, to spice the conversation yeah. up if you like so it's an operating model it's mm -hmm. an approach to leadership it it's a cultural change uh it's a set of values it's behaviors it's mm -hmm. actions right so i hear these all the time and and and, and i think you know part of why i really wanted to get you on here was to get the author's version stephen i'm going to ask you that question what actually is the art of action okay yeah now every time um i talk about it i i have people in the audience who've sort of heard it before and they they all come up with different things as well i mean yeah. what's quite interesting is that you know the first time i said oh well i thought it was all about delegation and now I've listened to you again. It's actually, it's all about alignment, isn't it? And, and then some, ah, oh, well, it's really all about culture and trust. And the answer is yes, it's all of those things. Um, I um, saw it as simply a way of translating strategy into action. So it presupposes that there is some sort of sense of strategic direction, at least it presupposes that you have competent people which is usually something you can take for granted with businesses today and that the organization itself is transparent enough that you can point a finger and say you're accountable for this and they're accountable for that and that the processes don't constrain people enough so if I'm asked to sort of put it in one word, I actually do use the word operating model, but I don't use it with all clients because sometimes they already have something else in mind that they call their operating model. It's a means of translating strategy into action in any environment, really, but in particular in the kind of VUCA environment that we deal with today. And I found it works pretty much across any industry. It works with startups. It works with big companies as well, though it's harder work there. Um, and 
is answering really some of the burning questions that people have. I mean, the simplest question that it needs to answer, as I put at the end of chapter one, is so what do you want me to do? Yes, that's an interesting thing because um, there's, there's a question that you ask, and we were just talking about that off air, which you've, you've styled around that, what do you want me to do? But you've used a bit of a, uh, shall we say, a pop music <laughs> <laughs> bent on yeah. that. Well, the consequence of asking that question <laughs> is that essentially it's it leads to a challenge, um, which is what I call the Spice Girls question. It's uh, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. And funnily enough, um, senior executives um, find that very hard to do. Their usual default is to give people a great list of stuff, of initiatives and must win battles and work programs and i don't know what and of course it just confuses people um but the key question is what matters most now and answering that question is difficult it involves sorting through the complexities and ambiguities of the environment working out what is really driving success what is the basis of competition and critically making choices so when people give direction, um, they need to turn the shades of gray of reality into black and white, because when you're facing a dilemma somewhere inside, you want to, you know, you reach T-junction, you've got to turn left or right. It's no use saying, well, there's five reasons for going left and six reasons for going right. You, you've got to say, no, if in doubt, this comes first. This is what really matters. And um, that's a demanding intellectual discipline so when when i work with people on strategy formulation i try to distill their thinking to um formulate it as an intent hence leading through intent is what i call this approach um which says this is what we have to achieve and why so it's a what and a why a task and a purpose and the task is only meaningful if it tells you not only so this is what we're going to do but this is what we're not going to do these are the products and customers we're not interested in um if we're going through a period when a whole load of things have to change yeah we need revenue growth um but we need to renew the product suite if in doubt renewing the product suite comes first um that's our main effort and maybe in six months time we will shift that but we need to get through a big agenda people tend to sort of dump the agenda so it becomes a whole load of lists <laughs> yes. you can't execute strategy with lists it's good for doing the shopping but not for strategy right you need structure and so this comes first then that then that then that and sometimes i draw it up as what i call a main effort map which shows how that's going to shift over time um but the military had been doing this sort of stuff for you know quite a long time, long time yes. and if it works for them it's been stress tested i would say it yes can i can, can i just dig a little a little sideways but deeper on on, on, yep. on that. so one of the things i see worldwide um and okrs has become uh, yes. Opted yeah. across many, many organizations, you know, popularized by Andy and and then John mm -hmm. Dower and et cetera, et cetera, and Google and et cetera. How does that interplay with the art of action? Okay, well, um, I come across lots of people who use OKRs, of course. And uh, a lot of the practitioners, the OKR consultants, have problems because it's it's not always clear where these goals come from and how they all relate to each other. And the technique for putting leading through intent into action um, is designed to create a hierarchy of goals. So everyone unpacks the implications of the next level up. So you're given a high level intent and you derive your own from it. And then you have to say how you're going to measure whether you're getting there or not. So that's when your KPIs and OKRs come in. So i see it very much as a complement to okrs but what i would guard against is jumping straight into the okr thing 
they can end up also just being this and generating work. I hear that complaint an awful lot. Um, I actually think it's very dangerous to try and run um, strategy execution on the basis of sets of metrics. Um, my big bugbear uh, was the balanced scorecard. If you want to oh, yes. amuse yourself, you'll find a few <laughs> pages about that in Chapter 7, which have abused yes. some of the reviewers. Um, I think it's a little bit of the tail wagging the dog. It's actually a very sort of tailoristic mechanism um we need I, I i i tell people not to think about it as a scorecard but as a dashboard it's giving you information about what's going on which you need in order to make good decisions about what to do next some of the measures may be targets so they're your scorecard if you like but you better be careful about how many targets you have and that they're not in conflict with each other and once you set a target, you better be bloody sure that it is what you really, really want, because you're going to get that and nothing else. Uh, so I, I'm very careful um, with the use of metrics. Um, but a Swedish friend of mine has actually written a little paper about this, sort of comparing leading through intent with OKRs. Leading through intent's more effort, yeah, especially initially, getting the alignment, because alignment is uh, produced by getting a common shared understanding. It's not a matter of sort of repeating a phrase or, or, or a slogan or, or just a set of measures. Um, and you have to work on that. Uh, once you've done that work, those things start to get a lot easier. And the second round always a lot quicker and then people have kind of got it and they can just revise as they go. So I'd see them fitting together. I heard you say there about alignment and and yeah, yeah I, I like the way that you stitch that together with leading through intent but it's that once you have that alignment that enables the autonomy which equals the absolutely truth. yeah yeah uh, uh, so it, it's curious actually so when I was writing the book I was trying to explain uh, the thinking behind it and simply said that that most people think as alignment and autonomy as being sort of ends of a single line of spectrum and the insight behind this approach this historical approach is that they're not they're independent variables and that actually the more alignment you have the more autonomy you can afford to grant people if you don't have alignment and give them autonomy you get chaos so i produced this little sort of matrix which was picked up by others notably spotify who produced little uh thing about that on youtube which went viral <laughs> yeah. uh, which was very kind of them except that they didn't tell me where it came from uh but you know what the hell uh they're using it that's the main thing um so you really have to do that work on alignment um not uh by creating a lots of tight controls, but by developing what I call this common shared understanding. And as you move up that axis, simultaneously you give people more freedom of action. Um, that's contextual, it depends on the situation, also the capabilities and the confidence of the people that you have. But what you're aiming to do is to go high, high, high alignment and high autonomy at one and the same time and when you think about it it's not actually a paradox it's just common sense yes uh, it is common sense but then you know as they say <laughs> common it's sense not common is, practice <laughs> that's right that is correct so it's good to have a framework to, to to tie that around that so so that lines up with you know leading through intent as you as you now call it um what i see again as i talk to many clients and and talk to many people across the world though intent-based leadership or leading through intent or, or, or all of these these mechanisms have become in vogue but how you actually do it like i talk to a lot of executives who go i i i, I generally get it but how do i make it happen and so mm -hmm. i'm thinking in that is you know what if i was asking you from that point of view what would you say to me well when I work with clients on this, um, the sort of key methodology is what I call the briefing and back briefing cycle. And it looks very simple. 
right? A, a strategy briefing, which is based on a technique that the military use, is just as five questions. So what's the context? What's the higher intent, one or two levels up? What's my intent? What are the implied tasks? How do I allocate responsibilities for carrying that out? And what are the boundaries, boundary conditions that we're operating in? In other words, what freedoms do we have and what constraints do we have to observe? Well, that sounds pretty straightforward. But once people get going, they find it isn't. Um, I have a rule of thumb that it takes three goes to get a good one. Um, and of course, that's just part of it. So you produce one of these things. We usually work in teams. Um, they often don't have a very clear statement of what the higher intent is. So I say, well, what do you think it ought to be? What, what kind of things has your boss been telling you? And what, what does corporate say? And so on. let's try and sort of work that one out because we're going to check it all. The context is terribly important. If you, this is about situational awareness. If you, if you misunderstand the position you're in and what's going on in the external environment, you can be way out and it's terribly hard to correct that. So we actually spent quite a lot of time on that. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and then it's sort of what, what are we trying to achieve in this period? And people usually start off by saying, well, it's some kind of, task you know it's sort of something that they've been told to do and as we think about it we realize well no that's not what really matters that's just a sub part of it we have to step back a lot people are often thinking on the level below them actually and they have to be sort of pulled back to say no this is this is the level that you should be thinking at um and then there's the tasking the rule of good tasking is no gaps no overlaps and um that is the bit that people tend to start off thinking it's the most important one. I, I was talking to one woman, uh, she was a pretty senior executive in the Pharmaco a while ago. And, and um, when she produced her draft, I spent an hour on Zoom with her going through it all. And she said, um, this was sort of after the whole process had been completed. She said, uh, you know, I was really surprised you spent about two thirds of our time talking about the context. And I was thinking, why is he spending all this time on this? I kind of know that what I'm concerned about is getting my people to do things. So she wanted to jump to question four. But I thought, well, you know, he's, he's the prof sort of thing. But then when I went out and told my people, it, she, she, did, she said they had an almost insatiable hunger for the context. That was the big mystery. To, they wanted to know what's going on in the world. And to me, it was kind of obvious. And that's when I realized you know, why Stephen had spent all this time with me. <laughs> and once we got all that clear and my own intent clear, and they asked some very penetrating questions, well, what do you really mean by this? And why is it, um, isn't it that? And it, it is this and not that, is it? So can we sort of make a choice? You know, if in doubt, I do this and not that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then doing the tasking was really easy. And the final question is, what are our freedoms and what are the constraints? And by constraints, we don't mean sort of problems. Uh, we mean what are the boundary conditions we have to impose? Um, you know, health and safety, right? You must maximize the flow of oil from this world, but on no account compromise our safety requirements, the engineering standards. Um, everybody always has two freedoms and constraints. One is time, which is a resource, but you have a deadline. Right, and you have some money, but the budget has a limit, so that is also a freedom. I mean, you can use a resource and a constraint, and you need to investigate how hard uh, those constraints are, whether there's room to negotiate, and so on and so forth. Um, but there can be um, a range of others, you know, carrying things like, but on no account allow this to happen. You know, you might say, okay, we're gonna. Um, go for revenue growth this is a new business we need to gain market share but do not allow net margins to fall below four percent for example yeah. and then but you know if you come away from oh well we've got to have profitable growth so you know we we've got this at 20 percent growth target but we need to have a margin target as well and saying they think they've got some kind of balance well no they haven't they create a confusion because when I'm sitting in front of a large customer at the end of the year, 
and they're offering me a big contract which will exceed the sales margin, but at a very low margin with 2%, which means I'm not going to make the margin target. What do you want me to do? Right? Whereas if you say, if you force yourself to make that choice at the beginning, you say, okay, it is, it is about revenue, but if you're going to go below that net 4%, walk away. Then somebody knows what to do. It's a, it's a, it sounds like a subtle, simple change. It makes a whole load of difference to people's life. I hear in that when you're talking in that particular mode. I've heard you talk about um, the three gaps as well. Uh huh. So how do they interplay with that when you? Right. Going, yeah. Going well, this is where through. it all comes from, really. So, so the basis is. Um, it's of, of the whole of this is to ask yourself, given the nature of the environment, what are the demands being made on our organizations and what would a successful one have to be? What would it have to be able to do? And I go back to Clausewitz's concept of friction. They're sort of talking about friction of fog in war um and his conception of the organization as an organism rather than as a machine which is actually the kind of thinking that has dominated a lot of business theory coming from economics and it goes back to taylor of course and friction creates three gaps um so when we try to execute we make some plans to decide on actions we're going to take to achieve some outcomes and there are gaps between them and the first one uh is the knowledge gap uh, we never know everything we'd like to know. And the implication of that is that we cannot make perfect plans. Um, we have to accept residual uncertainty. And then the alignment gap, uh, which is the gap between plans and actions, which is that people don't always do what you ask them to do, either because they haven't understood or they've understood and they disagree or they don't like the consequences. <laughs> Now, they have different interpretations of things. But even if you were able to make a perfect plan, everyone did what they were told, you still wouldn't be sure that you'd achieve the outcomes you want. Because when you take action in the external environment, other people are going to react to what you do. And some of them are actually trying to make our lives difficult. They're called competitors. And there are chance events. Uh, I don't have to listen these days, right? I mean, we just go back over the last six months and produce the list as long as your arm. And they make really fundamental differences um, to the way things go. So we have a paradox that we need to be very, very focused on what matters, but also very flexible to deal with the obstacles that are going to come in our way and exploit the opportunities that we could not foresee. So the answer to the knowledge gap is work out what really matters. So that's answer the Spice Girls question. Uh, the way to deal with the alignment gap is to brief and back brief. Um, so I talked about the briefing. But of course, that's just stage one. What you do is so you, you say to people, so this is my intent. This is the kind of area I want you to work on. Please go away, have a think and come back and tell me what you're going to do as a result. And that turns communication from a line, usually running from the top down, to a loop, which is what effective communication is, of course. This is how we find out whether we've got this common shared understanding. And normally when the back brief takes place, we find out that, in fact, we hadn't. We thought we had, but actually, no, we're only like, you know, 60, 70 percent of the way there. And thank God we didn't set off as we were because there had been a fucking mess to deal with in six months time. <laughs> Uh, so we clear all that up before we even start. There's usually another revision after that. And then people are confident enough to be able to say, OK, I know these are the boundary conditions, but within those boundary conditions, I have the call, right? The person with the best information at the point of time makes the call and I already have permission. I don't have to ask for it again. I just tell the boss, uh, by the way, we were going to do this, but we've now decided to do that because, okay, bang. Uh, by the way, we, we started doing that last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that should be fine. So we get fast decision making. Um, we, we avoid future friction by addressing friction, looking friction straight in the eye and dealing with it right at the beginning. We all expect things not 
to go according to plan. So rather than have a plan that could get derailed, we are prepared for pretty much anything that could happen. And as you go, I encourage people to think about how robust their decisions are. Usually the people sort of try and optimize their decisions for value, but that tends to assume that there's going to be one potential set of outcomes. One, well, there's one future scenario, which is the right one. I only think about, so try and make a decision that will be okay under any plausible set of futures. That's what I call robust. Um, and maybe is really good under one of the scenarios, but it's not a disaster under any of them. One of my clients has formulated that in a phrase that comes from decision theory, minimize maximum regrets. Mm. Uh, and a regret might be, oh dear, this went badly wrong, but it might also be, oh, that was an opportunity we passed by. So it covers the positive, yeah. but the negative side of it. So think about that as you go. I like that. I like that a lot. So one, one of the questions I've always had, uh, and this, so I'm going to indulge myself now, everyone, because if I've got Stephen Bung here, I'm going to ask a question I want to know. <laughs> go ahead. Tactical versus strategic. Do you know how many times in organisations I've heard, wow, they were, look, we don't have time for it to be strategic. We need it to be tactical. Hmm. So... Tactical versus strategic. How do you deal with that, Stephen? Okay, you... well, uh, once again, uh, my old friend, those of you who read the book will know my old friend Helmut von Moltke, the elder, dealt with this. Um, he inherited a model uh, coming from the, in the middle of the 19th century, which, which had strategy and tactics. Right? And tactics was basically based on drills and standard operating procedures. And good tactics are extremely useful, extremely valuable, right? If your guys can fire and load faster than the other lot, you've got a big advantage. If they can maneuver at speed because they practice on the parade ground, you've got a big advantage and so on. And we use standard operating procedures all the time in business as well. And if we have good ones, they are equally helpful because the guys in charge know that the guys on the front line know how to do this and they don't have to interfere. They know it's going to work. It's been done lots of times before. It, it, it produces high quality and speed. Um, then we have strategy. So the strategy is not about doing things right, but about doing the right things in the first place. Uh, but once the strategy has been formulated, that's binding on everyone. And so if the strategy is binding and the tactics are binding, everybody just has to understand strategy and behavior like a robot. And Moltke realized that's not going to work because there's a level in the middle. Uh, he called that middle level, linking them, um, operational art. I just call it the executional level. And that is an area where people are able to exercise freedom of decision and action within bounds to deal with the unpredictable to deal with the things that cannot be codified in standard operating procedures. And I encourage all my clients to think about where the boundaries are in their business. There are some businesses which can be very largely SOP'd. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I was, one of my clients years ago was a, ran a chain of pub restaurants in the UK. And I remember the marketing director said to me, if I gave um, a, a, a branch manager, a pub manager, a marketing budget he'd spend it all in the first week and it would achieve nothing <laughs> so everything uh, pretty much so so the the menu standards the pricing the decor uh it's all laid out uh central purchasing but the pub manager can schedule local labor because it depends on local weather conditions so we let him decide just a couple of days before how many people he wants to bring in and he buys all the perishable goods like the salads and all the rest of it locally but that's it so there's for for the pub manager there's a very narrow area of discretion the execs of course are more discretion right they set up all the rest of it um and the business i grew up in in BCG, the only standard operating procedures were the uh, typeface we had to use, although big arguments about that, actually, <laughs> business standard, <laughs> and boilerplate on proposals. 
for legal reasons. Everything else is up to partners. So we had this massive era of freedom because every client was different and so on and so forth. And most businesses are somewhere in between those extremes, um, but they need to work out where it is. So you need to think not strategy and tactics, but strategy operations and tactics. Thank you for answering that for me, because so I, I, I have read it in the book, but you've you've just described it in a, in a way that, that that makes sense to me in the way that I see it happening within organisations. I'm going to just take a little sideways journey now. Um, it is a remote podcast. And one of the things that I've seen over the period of time is when we went into remote, we all know why we had this this big cataclysmic event that pushed us all into remote. You know, remote yeah. and work and distributed has been happening for years and yeah. organizations have dabbled with it, but this was the that 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 alchemy thing that made made us all go there. So when we talk thinking about the strategy, you know. What happened was I see the, strate the, the strategy and the strategic um, imperative became very micro, became very simplified, and, and it was round survival, right? And how mm -hmm. we A to B. Now we're sort of moving roughly out of this thing, as we think, right? And now we've got remote and hybrid. And what's happening, I see, is executives and, and organizations trying to go back to the macro. But because of the remote and hybrid frame that's that's come over the top of it, there's a real contention point with there. How do you see that playing out? How do you see working with that? Or, or what are you seeing across the world? Because you're obviously seeing that working. Yeah. Yeah. So the initial reaction was kind of panic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> panic or paralysis. Oh, my God. Um, and people were thinking about, short-term survival which is of course what they had to think about if they hadn't thought about that you know we've got to reduce inventories we lay off all, all the rest of it uh just to get through uh, then they wouldn't be here if you don't think about today there isn't going to be a tomorrow um then things settle and you realize that tomorrow is coming and you wonder whether you're prepared for it now um a colleague of mine i'll just mention this now called rebecca Honkus, um who I've worked with a lot on this stuff, uh, is actually in the process of writing a book called Survive, Reset, Thrive. And it should be out next year. You might want to make a note of that. Oh. Survive, Reset, sure. Thrive. And she deals in great detail, but very practically, with this issue of how you, A, how you survive, a lot of practical measures there, then move on to a strategy reset thinking about tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and then get that embedded to thrive and how you have to loop back periodically and know ah uh, you know something's happened which is calls our current strategy into question we need to loop back and make sure that we are capable of surviving what's coming it's connected very much with that word being robust so you know is our supply given what's happened in the last six months how robust is our supply chain for example you know maybe that wasn't top of our agenda two years ago it was just you know cost employment where the next bit of revenue is going to come from now we need to think that one through um i um i went back uh, as I suppose, given my background, you'd expect me to, to military examples because um, generals deal with crisis all the time. A battle is nothing but a series of crises. And I wrote a little piece that was published by the Boston Consulting Group. You can find it on the internet, uh, which analyzes how Ulysses Grant dealt with the Battle of Shiloh. And to sort of cut that story short what grant did when he um he found chaos on the battlefield his troops had been surprised by an unexpected confederate attack uh, there was mayhem and he spent the day on the battlefield and i've used a metaphor of his mind as a clock with the second hand rushing round and the second hand that's rushing round is the leadership one which is stabilizing the current situation um and at the same time 
calling for reinforcements and doing simple practical things like making sure that people have enough ammunition. He's getting his stuff a lot. At the same time as the second night's going on, he's he's managing, um, he's pulling together resources. So he can't use his cavalry in that terrain, which is thickly wooded. So he stations them at the back of the woods and they rally troops who were trying to flee. The other side didn't think of doing that. So everyone who ran off disappeared. Uh, he pulled together an artillery battery that he thought he could use in the evening, which indeed he did. So he's resource managing. That's the minute hand. But at the same time, the hour hand, which is the strategy hand, the directing hand is going around. And he's realizing that although they've been horribly surprised, their attackers are in confusion. Um, he notices things about, you know, well, their attacks don't seem coordinated. I think they've all got messed up. By the way, they're going to be running out of ammunition and they're not going to know where their guys are. They're going to spend the night in the open. They're going to be tired, hungry, exhausted, and probably low on ammo. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to hit back. And that evening, he has a meeting with Sherman, believe it or not. Uh, no slouch. And Sherman comes up to Grant and says, well, Grant, we've had a hell of a day, haven't we? And he was thinking, we've got to retreat. That was in Sherman's mind. And Grant just looked at him and said, yep, sure have. Lick them tomorrow, though, which is what they did. So this, uh, I mean, the, the guys who can yet yeah, deal with the current emergency, but at the same time are thinking about the next day, and deal with that emergency in such a way that they have the resources to deal with the next day and have that insight into the essential point of the situation and see an opportunity where others just see disaster. They're the people who are going to go through the reset. They're the ones who thrive in the end as well. And I think one of the interesting things about most of my clients is that they've come out of covid saying well um actually when we review the direction we were headed in it was actually pretty much correct we have to make some course corrections but we're not changing our strategy fundamentally we just got to execute it a lot faster because all the trends we yeah. saw are now just upon us Right, it's not a future trend. It's stuff that's happening today, and we can deal with it now, which is quite an interesting outcome. Thank you, Stephen. Look, we're right close to the end of our time now, unfortunately, and and it's been just an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, for anybody that wants to to engage with you or engage your services or talk with you, how can they get in touch with you? Best thing is uh, email. Um, uh, if you Google me, funnily enough, you get me. Um, I have a rather peculiar surname. And when I was at school, all little boys made fun of it, calling me Bungy and Bungai and Bung it away. You don't know where it's been. Um, now I have my revenge because there are so few Bungays in the world. If you put Bungay to Google, you're probably going to get me. Um, so you can find me there. You can find the website, which is just stephenbungay.com, and there's a link to my email address mail at stephenbungay.com and uh happy for anyone to get in touch that's been brilliant look we're we're right at the end of our time thank you again for being with us on all the remote things if you're listening to this don't forget go like subscribe so we can keep this thing going stephen bungay thank you for being on all the remote things today well thank you tony and good luck to you all